it's not often that we have the privilege of hearing an evangelical giant, but today we hear Dr. Will Norton, who by all considerations belongs in the category of those whom God chose in not the 1930s and 1940s right here on this campus to lead the evangelical community into a position of prominence and influence in the modern world. But he would be the first to say that this was not his nor their purpose. Rather, it was to bring the gospel to the world for whom Jesus died. And that has been the passion of Will Norton's life, along with his devoted wife, Colleen. A graduate of Wheaton's 1936 class, Dr. Norton, along with his new bride, made his way to the Belgian Congo in 1940, where they both served together with the evangelical mission of Ubangi. And there they founded the Bible Institute of the Ubangi. Upon returning to the States in 1950, our speaker began teaching at Trinity Seminary and Bible College, which was then located in Chicago, and later as president of that institution from 1957 to 1964, he oversaw its transformation to Trinity College and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And it was under his leadership that this institution relocated to the beautiful Deerfield campus. In 1965, Dr. Norton joined the Wheaton Graduate School faculty as professor of missions. And when I came here in 1973, he had already succeeded Professor Merrill Tinney as dean of the graduate school. Upon retiring from our faculty in 1980, he and Colleen went to Jos, Nigeria, where he founded the Equitheological Seminary under the auspices of SIM. In 1989, he joined the faculty of Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi as professor of missions. And in 1993, he moved to the Charlotte campus as distinguished professor of missions, serving that institution for 13 and a half years. This man never gives up. Will was one of the founding members of the missions branch of the University Christian Fellowship which began and continues the Urbana Missions Conference. He's, he served on that board for many years. He is one of God's choice servants whom the Lord has raised up to tell this world about Jesus. But you cannot talk about Will Norton without speaking about his devoted wife, Colleen, a graduate of Columbia Bi Biblical Seminary, who has stood alongside him in a ministry of prayer and teaching and service to their family for more than 70 years. One of the great laurels which they wear proudly is the Lord's gift of their five children, two of whom the Lord needed in his heavenly kingdom at a tender age, and three of whom serve Christ in his kingdom in our needy world. Will Sr. is dean of the Meek School of Journalism at the University of Mississippi, Oxford, Peter is a medical doctor in Abilene, Texas, and Seth occupies our own Wheaton College Kwame Chair of Political Economy. Before Dr. Norton comes to us and speak, speaks, I would like to read to you from Luke 24. Let us hear God's word. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. 
the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went out to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow at heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were talking, still talking together, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be to you. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. I like the way you read. <laughs> All those in favor will please say aye. Aye. <laughs> Great. He's been here before when I've been here. Can you believe that? <laughs> we were together 30 years ago this past summer, 1980. They put me out to pasture in June of 1980. I couldn't find the pasture. <laughs> and that's no moo either. But we were together in Jerusalem. That particular year, there were 80 students in the summer program in Jerusalem. Four faculty, two for 40, two for 40. And Dr. Bullock was there, and we had a great time. In the very place where Jesus was, and it's such a blessing to have him here. Can you imagine Jesus dying after three and a half years of teaching and pointing to the Old Testament, whether you're reading in Luke or Matthew, Mark, whatever. Luke, 18, uh, Luke uh, chapter 18, he told him specifically, I am going to die. And in three days, rise again. He had the supper. And he gave them the bread and the cup. And what do you think those rascals did when they got outside? Two of them were arguing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. I mean, it's awesome. 
to see how disciples of Jesus treat Jesus. What we get out of him. Instead of knowing that he prayed in John 17 that we would be one with him as he is one with the Father and the Father in him and he in the Father that we would be one with them and in them. What in the world goes on with students? The master teacher who is not only involved in the creation of the universe, but in all the laws of learning and teaching. (laughs) Did he fail? I think some institutions would have fired him. On resurrection morning, they come to the grave. One of them thinks it's a gardener. Say, where did you put him? Can't find him. As though he had never told them he's going to rise in three days. Peter comes, he peeks in, but a fellow beat him to it. He's John, and he runs right in and sees things as they are, and Peter finally gets in, and the book says he went home. Can you believe it? When he pointed out to them from the scriptures, and I tell you, these two on the way to Emmaus, they're fast learners. They had an IQ. The Holy Spirit was with him. And he went through Moses and all the scriptures about himself that he would die and rise again. The third day, I mean, not the fourth or fifth or ten days later, the third day before corruption sets in. And they don't know who he is. And they just pour out their hearts. What a master teacher comes to class. He just gets it all out of there. He got the, all the wrong things out of the system. And then he opens a book, opens a scroll, Moses, and all the scriptures. And they received the bread from him as he blessed it. Jesus! He disappears. And they look at each other. There's only one thing to do. Tell it. Jesus lives. <laughs> all night long they walk. You ever walk seven miles? Honestly, all these athletes and all these gung hoes on <laughs> doing things, you know. Have you ever walked seven full miles? Oh, I know there's some of you here. Raise your hand. That's all right. <laughs> but walk seven miles without a flashlight in the dark all night. Bright and early in the morning, before they had their oatmeal. Here these guys are, Jesus lives! Huh? Yeah, he's living. He was on the road, we were with him. We saw his hands. He blessed the bread and disappeared. Look, once you know that Jesus lives, you'll tell it. And maybe we need to look in the mirror. Why aren't we telling about Jesus? Right here on this campus, 1936, something happened. We were in chapel, February, 1936, special services. Dr. Robert C. McCulkin, president of Columbia Bible College, was a speaker. He came from South Carolina in the middle of February. No long handles, no adequate overcoat. Poor Uncle Bob, as we used to call him there, he was confined to bed. A substitute speaker, Dr. Walter Wilson, Kansas City Bible Institute at that time, Calvary Bible College, Calvary College now. He spoke, service was about to end, and right down there in the front where seniors used to sit, I don't know where they sit anymore, they might sit in the balcony because they're a little above us. <laughs> there he was, Don Hillis, the pastor of the Tabernacle Church here in town, student pastor. A lot of us went there. And he said, excuse me, Dr. Wilson, a lot of the students are asking about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. 
Some came over that whole audience. Students stood up one by one and asked for prayer, confessing sin. What in the world kind of sin goes on in 1936 on Wheaton College? <laughs> I mean, this is not one of the church colleges around here. This is Wheaton. <laughs> and that service didn't last, didn't finish until 10 o'clock that night. They lined up in Pierce Chapel on the side walls, taking turns one by one, asking for prayer. Have you ever asked any of your colleagues here for prayer? Out of that came the Student Foreign Missions Fellowship. Now this has a tie in here. Jesus met his disciples. They were telling their friends, Jesus lives, it's true. And Jesus goes right alongside him. I mean, right through the wall. And he says, peace. And then he opens the scriptures to them. Moses, the first five books, the Psalms, the Psalms and all of the writings that are not prophetic and are not mosaic and the prophets and shows them one by one by one by one who he is in his resurrection form. How did he do it? He opened their minds that they might get it sunie me. They might get it all together. Now it's translated roughly openly Understand, I mean, you understand and you don't understand, but you're understanding when you don't understand. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> I mean, that's our English language. But here it is. Sunni Amy, with an E Amy. It's getting it together, the idea that things are flowing together. And the scriptures flow together showing who the Lord God Almighty is in Jesus Christ. Then he took them and gave them a seminar for 30 days up in Galilee. And boy, wouldn't that have been one to get, get to. And 10 days after that seminar was over and he had ascended, the Holy Spirit came to take of the things of Christ and make them real, and he did. And of all the guys to stand up, old noggin head himself, Peter, stands up and says, hey, you know what? This is what Joel said was going to happen. Joel, who's Joel? And he opened it up. And he went from the prophets into Moses and into the Psalms that Jesus lives. And 5,000 people come to Jesus. 3,000 people come to Jesus. They're coming to Jesus to believe in him because he lives. They got it all together. And not too long afterwards, that spread. And here's a little fellow, Stephen. And he was telling the story of Jesus. And those who believed in God, and those who said that Moses is sacred in his writings, and the prophets are sacred in their writings, and their whole system of religion and worship in the temple, they're the ones that grabbed Jesus. They're the ones that killed him. And on Pentecost Day, he showed it. Peter did. And then Stephen comes along and believes. And he's very open in his testimony. And they get a hold of him and arrest him. But he gave a message there on Moses and the Psalms and the prophets. And Saul was standing there when he was arrested. Because he blasphemed, Stephen did, by giving this kind of a teaching. And Saul was standing there guarding 
the Mumus, of the high priests and the rest of them who were stoning Stephen. And Stephen gets hit by a rock and he goes down. He said, I see him standing at the right hand of the Father. And he gets another rock. And you hear him. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he says in a whispering prayer, don't hold this sin against him. Saul stands there and sees him. And he hears him. This fellow dying in his own blood with rocks coming on him like this. And he says, don't hold this sin against him. And he is a chief persecutor of the church. Stephen had it all together even in his dying moment. And what happened to Saul? Well, you know the story. He heard that voice on his way to Damascus. Saul, Saul, huh? Why are you persecuting me? Who are you? Lord, what do you want me to do? How's that for a conversion? <laughs> Pretty quick, huh? <laughs> Stephen, don't hold this sin against him. How can man say that? Because he said, I see him up there. He got it all together. And the chief persecutor of the church came to Jesus. And he didn't confess any sin. He just says, what do you want me to do, Lord? How about that? Well, we got seminary training. You know, I have a little eyesight trouble. Isn't it wonderful for a preacher to have eyesight trouble, can't read the clock? He just goes on and on and on. <laughs> but I know some of you have gone out, and I just said to somebody that, you know, if you walk out, I may call on you to pray. <laughs> and that might help the cause. In any case, we'll conclude. But how does this play out? When guys like you and Colleen and I were in your age. We met and she was the chick on campus. <laughs> At Columbia in those days. And I can't go into all the details on that romance, but let me tell you, it was a Lulu. <laughs> and I got it all together in a hurry. And I tell you, it's a lot more spiritual than what you are responding as. It really was. But we can't take the time. It's just too bad. Maybe we can have a little coffee hour someplace, and you can find out. She was a long line of Southern ancestry, and me and I coming along with my Swedish accent. And you talk about cross-cultural communications. <laughs> Can you imagine a Southern belle marrying uh, an immigrant Swede kid? Well, that's what happened. And there was no anthropologist around to tell us how. <laughs> oh, the miracle of it. Anyhow, we were committed to the Lord to do what he wanted us to do. And 700 million people, it was said, had never heard one time of Jesus Christ. So we got married one week after graduation. It was a Tuesday night. Nobody gets married on a Tuesday night anymore. I mean, you got to have a weekend. We got married on Tuesday night. One week after graduation. We had accepted by the mission board and the Swedish mission board wouldn't take a girl from South Carolina before they saw her. Ha <laughs> ha! I brought this chick in. <laughs> and guess what? My pastor said, well, she looks like a Swede anyhow. <laughs> That's cross-cultural communication. <laughs> Give him the real thing. And we spent the summer 70 years ago running up and down Nebraska, Colorado, 
Illinois and Iowa getting bright diamonds and nickels so we could go to Congo. And we got out to Greeley, Colorado and heard in the motel with the window open, no air conditioning, that Germany, that Britain had declared war on Germany. Oh, what are you going to do now? We're going to the mission field. There's no way to go by way of Belgium to Belgian Congo because the war was on there. Belgium had been invaded. How are you going to go in the mission field? Get it all together. That's what Jesus said. And we prayed, and we prayed. There was one travel agency in Chicago, Cook's Travel Agency, and we were going down there, talking to them on the phone, going down there, going to Congo by way of Japan, going through the Panama Canal, going down to Argentina and crossing over to Cape Town, working our way around the west coast of Africa, all kinds of possibilities. All of a sudden, we got a call that there is a way open to West Africa. You want to go? Sure. But it only goes to Monrovia, and we were going to go to Belgian Congo. Yeah, we'll, we'll take that. Oh, that's crazy. It sure is. And if our sons did that, I don't know what I would do, really. <laughs> Nor my commitment. And I don't know what I would do. But we did. And I can't tell you that whole story, but it took one week to get from Port Arthur, Texas, to see the lights of Miami. One week. Two more weeks to get to the west coast of Africa, Dakar. I mean, that was a Caribbean cruise. <laughs> what was it? No, it wasn't Queen Mary. It was the SS West Irmo built for World War I. And I asked the Likes Brothers agent down there in Port Arthur, Texas, what's the cargo? Get it all together now. Don't forget Sunni, Amy. Well, he says it's a super load of high octane aviation fuel in 50 gallon drums. I looked at him, and boy, I had all these thoughts. I mean, we ain't been married a year. What sense does this make to go out on a time bomb? You know, the Graf Spee, the biggest, latest German vessel, was sunk in the South Atlantic. And I have to make a decision. It was, tell the guy, forget it. We were going where Jesus leads. What's Stephen all about? What's Peter all about? What's Paul all about? Paul said in an early letter to the Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. But I am living, yet not I, Christ is living in me. Galatians 2.20. At the end of his life, he said in Philippians 1.21, to me, to be living is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, all of this did not come through, but the essence of it was there. And we went through with that deal. It took us two and a half months to get where we were going. And finally, we got to Africa. We got to Freetown, Sierra Leone. A fella came on deck, a little preacher boy from Pandora, Ohio, Reverend Sheets good old-fashioned German name. Missionary there with the United Brethren. Asked us what we were doing. Told him, we're going to Monrovia. Get off there and hope to get a ship or something to get to Congo. He said, look, it doesn't even have a port. They have to anchor outside and unload in little canoes and get the cargo in there. Maybe during the war, nobody will stop there. He said, stay here. See if a ship will come along. Well, all right, that's real hospitality. Never saw us before, done a thing about it, but we're missionaries. <laughs> so he took a chance, a United Brethren chance. We got off. And you know one of the things there, Albert Academy was there. In the Albert Academy, we went to chapel, and they had a little 
African boys choir, and they sang, prayer is the key of heaven, prayer is the key of heaven, prayer is the key of heaven, faith unlock the door. <laughs> that actually happened 70 years ago last summer, and we're still remembering it. Something's wrong with us, huh? Yeah. But that's it. Faith unlocks the door. We stayed three weeks. One day we were on the porch of his missionary home, and he put his spyglass on his ship coming in. It's a French vessel. Yeah, it's a French vessel, he said. We ran down in his car to the French agency and signed up. We had no visas. We had no assurance of anything. We got on a French ship. Got on the west coast of Africa. Another week. We got on the French coast of Africa. Got off at Douala. On our anniversary day, we arrived there. One year, the chick was still a chick. <laughs> but we couldn't get off, we didn't have papers. And it was too late in the day, the office closed. And we sat on that empty French ship, the ballast shifting from one side to the other as they pump water to keep ballast in the ship and to keep it afloat. Next day, we got off went to the office, but on our way down the gangplank were two couples. Guess who they were? You won't guess, in a thousand years. <laughs> One was an alumnus and his wife from Wheaton, in the class of 1911. Oh, he was an old duffer. <laughs> and the other fella was a pitcher on the baseball team at Wheaton in the 19, early 30s, Pierce and his wife. Wheaton people. We were welcomed by Wheaton people at the ends of the earth. <laughs> Had no idea they were a million miles anywhere. Else. And they helped us to know where to go. Well, it's a long story. But we got to the capital and found that John Drinkwater of London had a trucking service. Prayer is the key of heaven. Faith unlocks the door. We met John Drinkwater. We signed a contract with him for a pickup, a driver, and a cook boy. We bought camp cots, some mosquito netting. And we started out three, uh, 11 o'clock on Thursday morning for a three-day trip across Central Africa and didn't even have a map. I mean, all this relates. He's there at the right hand. He's praying for us. He's alive. Jesus lives. We spent nine years in service. I can't tell you the whole story, but Jesus lives. Now, let me tell you, theology is great, but if it doesn't get into your boots, it's dead. And there's nothing more corrupting, even in evangelicalism, than dead theology. Jesus lives, and he shows himself day by day in the word. It's too much to tell all at once. But do you really want him to open your mind? Do you want him by the Holy Spirit to tell you who he is? You will get all the theology you need. But have you ever asked him to help you to get it all together? Because that's his job. That's what he did to the disciples. That's how Paul was converted. That's how the Gentiles began to hear. And Paul was martyred too. Look, every one of us as believers has been crucified with Christ. Thank him that you have. Because when you're crucified with Christ, You've been raised together with him to walk in newness of life, with him as the head of your life. And if he gives you a mate, you're together, one in Jesus. And I can't tell you all of what's happened. But Colleen and I in 70 years have seen him work one miracle after another. That's his job. Why do you cheat him out of his work? By not trusting him. Wouldn't you like to say it this morning, Lord Jesus? 
help me to get it together. And I tell you, one of the great blessings for in our lives is to come back to Wheaton, not only to see men like Dr. Bullock, but to see our son directing the Hastert Center and to know what God has done in his life. This is for real. Quit playing academia and tell Jesus this morning, Lord Jesus, help me to get it together. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, perform your work in each of our lives this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.